We, we started a, a new series last week at Oak Ridge called Refresh. And it's my belief and my desire to see God do something fresh here in our midst at Oak Ridge Wesleyan Church. We are invited by Jesus to draw near to God the Father and to ask and wait for what God wants to do in our lives, that namely sending of the promised gift of His Holy Spirit to empower us for the mission that Jesus had always intended for his people. If you have a Bible this morning, it might be a papery one, it might be a digitally one like this, but I'd invite you to get your Bible out, and if you would lift it up nice and high this morning and say, I got my Bible, PJ. We are going to be continuing through the book of Acts once again, so go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2 if you would. Do you remember the first time, or excuse me, the last time, actually, that you had to wait for something that you were excited about? You were looking forward to something, and and you were thinking in your mind, this is going to be really good, I've just kind of got to wait for it. Like, maybe you remember a TV show, or a movie series, or a book series, and and you had been kind of with the franchise for a while, and you had gotten to the point where the author or the writer was done, and yet you knew that there was another installment coming, and so you're you're waiting with anticipation, counting down the, the, the days till the release date or or maybe you have a favorite season maybe you really look forward to spring and those those flowers beginning to pop like pastor castilla was talking about earlier that first warm day of summer or the first cool crisp day of fall or the first snowfall of winter although if you look forward to the first snowfall of winter you're probably not present here in the sanctuary you might be joining us online this morning Maybe you remember your spouse cooking dinner somewhere in the kitchen and you were working somewhere else in the house and you smelled those smells and it was like, oh, this is going to be good. I just can't wait for it to get here. Or maybe you remember booking a vacation or a trip and you're looking up pictures of things online, where you're going to go and all the things you'll be able to experience and just watching as the second hand at work goes waiting to be able to go. I know for me, one of the things that always I get excited and it's, it's kind of hard when I'm waiting is when I order something online and then I have to wait for it to arrive at my house. And probably the worst thing I've ever purchased that, that just kind of made me antsy and excited and everything all at the same time was a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to buy uh, e-bikes or electronic bikes or pedal assist or whatever term you want to use. And we were really excited to purchase them. They, they weren't very inexpensive, but we were really excited for the opportunity that they were going to bring us. And I remember we'd researched different brands and we picked out the one we wanted and we went online and we paid what seemed like way too much money. And immediately, we get the notification that the money has left our account. And that's about it. (laughs) And I remember that they had told us it's going to be like 12 to 16 weeks before they actually arrive. And so I I knew that going in. But it was like the moment I purchased it, the money was gone. And I remember like every day, I'm like at the website, are there any updates? Like, is the factory building this thing over in China or wherever it's built? And and every day I'm there wondering and wondering and wondering and like months go by and suddenly I get the email. Your bikes have shipped. And if I was on the website like every day before, I was on the website like every hour at that point, like why can't they put a GPS tracker on my package? Finally, they arrived and I was super excited for that moment. The disciples in the opening chapters of Acts are in this waiting pattern, waiting on the Lord. Jesus had been with them and he had completed the work that he had come to do, his his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And Jesus, the the guy that had bodily walked around as God in human flesh for like the last 30 years with them, the last three and a half years or so, He'd gone back into heaven. And he said, the Father has something good for you. In fact, during his time on earth, he said, this is going to be better than when I'm physically walking around. God wants to do something in the sending of his Holy Spirit in your life. 
And we read in Acts chapter 2, the moment when the Holy Spirit arrives. It says this, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Stop. Who, who's they and, and what is this one place? If we back up a little bit into chapter 1, it says that there's about 120 disciples, followers of Jesus, that were gathering together as part of the early church. And the number 120 is kind of significant, actually, because if you go back in Jewish tradition, according to the rabbinic teaching of the, the, the oral teaching of the rabbis at that time that was later recorded as what we call the Mishnah, they would say 120 is the base number for like a group of people that could be considered a city or maybe a legitimate group within Jewish culture. And so there's 120 people and they're gathered together in one place. We're told they met together in an upper room, although we're not told exactly what that upper room was, whether this was the same upper room where they had the Last Supper, whether this is some wealthy person who's followed Jesus and they're allowing them to be there. Now, 120 is a pretty big group, so it's a pretty big room. It had to be something about like this size, right, to fit that. And it could have been uh, a, a room in the, the temple walls, in the temple courts. We know a little bit later that the disciples kept meeting there. But we know this, according to Acts 2, verse 1, that when the day of Pentecost came, they were together in one place. And suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. And they were staying in Jerusalem at that time, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these guys who are talking Galileans? How then can each one of us hear them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? But some made fun of them and said, they've had too much to drink. This story recounts for us the moment when the Holy Spirit comes and breathes fresh breath and fresh fire into this group of people. Something that sounds like the blowing of a violent wind and looks like tongues of fire that rest upon this group that is here. And for us, this morning at Oak Ridge, what I hope you're desiring in your life and what I hope that you're desiring for our church is a movement of the Holy Spirit in your individual lives and in our corporate lives. A desire to say, I believe in who Jesus was. I believe he really lived, really died, really rose and really ascended to heaven. But that that's not enough. That God wants to do something beyond that in your life. That Jesus doesn't just say, just look to me. Just look to me as something external and what I can do for you. Because quite frankly, the work I came to bodily do, it is finished work. And I have gone back to the Father and it's your job to partner with me to see the kingdom of God move. what we sang about a few minutes ago. How I long for heaven. That doesn't mean I sit here in a comfortable blue chair and wait for it to get here. It means right now, God, come in power. Help me to see not just the kingdom that is coming, but the kingdom that has now come. Because of the work of Jesus, you offer your Holy Spirit, I need you every hour. I need you. I want you now. Come in power now in this church, in this community. Now I need to see you. Here I am. Use me and fill me. 
Let's look at what happens in this story when the Holy Spirit comes and talk for just a few minutes about what that would look like, about what that would be like if the Holy Spirit were to come in our lives. And the first thing that I would notice saying, how does the Holy Spirit come into our lives? How does the Holy Spirit come into our church? Is to say that the Holy Spirit comes with prayer. If we backed up into chapter 1, verse 14, it tells us what this group of 120 people is doing. It says they joined together constantly in prayer. This was a group of devoted prayer warriors waiting on the Lord to fulfill His promise, sending the Holy Spirit by drawing near to God's presence in prayer. Prayer is not telling God something He doesn't already know. And it's not trying to convince God to do something He doesn't want to do. (laughs) Right? Sometimes we have these misperceptions of prayer or these, these ideas about prayer. And prayer isn't like we, we say to God, Hey, God, I wanted to, to let you know what's going on in my life. And he's looking down like, oh, Are you serious? I had no idea. Nor is consistent and constant regular prayer about motivating God to do something he doesn't want to do. Hey, God, can you do this? Hey, God, can you do this? Hey, God, can you do this? No, no, fine. If it will shut you up, I'll answer your prayers. Prayer really, and the consistency of prayer, is about us being the ones who are conformed and transformed to what God has already decided He wants to do and who he is. It's like God is in one shape and position, and he doesn't change. He's the same God. And and we keep trying to kind of come into relationship with God and saying, I want you to do what I want you to do. And God's saying, you're not fitting with me right now. That's why you're not seeing it. And we keep coming and keep knocking. But suddenly, as we keep coming, all of a sudden, we become changed in our orientation. We conform our lives more to what He looks like. And as we draw near to Him, we conform to what He already wanted to do and what His will was for us. For these first Christians, it was a way of recognizing some of their, first, their smallness and God's bigness. It was a way of recognizing their utter dependence on Him. It was a way of saying, God is God in heaven, and he has a mission for this earth, and he just did his part, life, death, resurrection, ascension. And he wants me to pick up the rest? I feel pretty small and pretty dependent on him. Do you want to see the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you want more than merely saying, I've prayed a prayer and I bought fire insurance so that I can go to the good place later on. But I actually long to see the power of God flowing in and through my life. I want a real and a genuine relationship where I abide in Him and He in me. I want to see my community and my family and my church transformed. I want to see the miracles of God happening. Do you really want what the Holy Spirit says you can have? Are you praying in a way that allows you to be changed? Not just, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But help me see you. Help me really know you. Help me to wait on you until you have conformed and changed and transformed me and you know that I am ready to receive what you have already determined is what you want. To give me. There was a power that caused Jesus to rise from the dead after the Roman execution. A dead guy rose. And that power 
that same power that brought Jesus back from the grave was available to these disciples. They had watched Rome hang Jesus on a cross. And they knew that same fate could await them. They were desperate for a power that was bigger than themselves. They were desperate for this Holy Spirit that comes with prayer and comes with purpose. Acts 2 tells us that the coming of the Holy Spirit was on the day of Pentecost. And Pentecost is, literally means 50th day. It is 50 days after Passover. And for Jews in the first century, they were celebrating what would have been called the Festival of Weeks. It was the festival of remembering the wheat harvest, and it had also come to be associated with the giving of God's law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And every Jewish male, no matter where they lived in the world, was required to make a trip to Jerusalem during the festival of weeks. And that's why this passage tells us that all of these people are gathered from all of these nations that some of you are like, I'm glad you pronounce that. I don't want to be doing that. They're all there and they're all gathered together to celebrate God's provision and the way that we relate back to God, the harvest and the law, what God gives to me and how I relate back to him. And everything is about to change. Everything about what we've known, everything about the old covenant that God had given and said, if you follow my law, you will receive blessing has changed. And Jesus has said, I've torn open the temple curtain. The presence of God resides with humanity. Everything that is going to happen now is different. The way that God provides for you is through the power of his presence that lives within you. The way that you relate back to God is the Holy Spirit who lives within you. It's not about the law that led to sin and death. It is about the spirit that I give that leads to freedom and leads to life. We don't always catch how awesome and how wonderful the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is. For many of us as Christians, we still say things like, wouldn't it be really cool if I could just see Jesus physically in front of me? And Jesus says, no, there's something even greater in the Holy Spirit. One way I like to think about it is, is a little bit like learning a, a new language. I know how to access uh, translation tools online, and, and sometimes I, I, in my role with the district, I will meet with people who, uh, they speak Creole or they speak Spanish. And, and when I meet with them, I, I'm very grateful that I have places I can go, like Google Translate, and I'll put a whole email in there and try to get it. Or, or sometimes I, I will speak to groups of people, and they speak either Creole or they speak Spanish, and, and I will get to share what I want to share and then there'll be a translator who will translate everything into their language. And it's a beautiful and it's a powerful way to communicate. But how much more could I communicate? How much better and clearer could I communicate with those groups of people if the language was actually something that was within me? If I actually knew their language, I would be able to communicate so much more clearly. And the illustration is so powerful that this is exactly what God does for his people right off the bat. As he enables these disciples who are gathered together, who he has said, I'm going to empower you to, to share your Jesus story with the entire world. He empowers them right off the bat to share the Jesus story with the entire world that is gathered here in Jerusalem. Everything changes when God resides in us and is not merely accessible to us. If you rewind again into to the, the first chapter of Acts, you see the disciples trying to make a decision. Judas has betrayed Jesus. He's hung himself. He's not a part of the group anymore. And they're saying, we need to find somebody to replace Judas. And so the, the law had given them the ability that they could cast lots to try to determine what God's will is. And so they throw dice to see who should, be, who should replace Judas. And Matthias is chosen. And it's the last place in the New Testament that lots are ever cast. 
Because if you want to know God's will, he gives you his Holy Spirit within you. The coming of the Spirit comes with prayer, it comes with purpose, and it comes with passion. When the Holy Spirit comes in your life, you know it. Verses 2 and 3 say that when the Holy Spirit came, it was like a violent wind, and it appeared as something that seemed to be like tongues of fire. Which means we don't know if there was actually literal wind or literal fire, but the people who were sitting there were saying to themselves, we don't know how to describe this event. It sounds to us something like rushing of wind in the household. It looks like whatever's happening, we have some kind of a vision of something happening, and it it looks like tongues of fire that are coming to rest upon God's people gathered here. And these are very powerful symbols for the Jewish people. Wind and fire. Wind commonly symbolized life. The the breath of life. All the way back in Genesis, you have God forming a pile of dust and breathing the breath of life into it. Jews would have been familiar with Ezekiel's story, one of the craziest stories of the Old Testament. He he sees a valley of bones. (laughs) And God says to Ezekiel, can the bones live? And if I'm Ezekiel, I'm going, "Uh uh-uh, they dead. (laughs) But God, he says, only you know, God. And God says, prophesy to the four winds. And winds come from everywhere around the valley, blowing over the bones, and they stand up. And then like sinew and skin comes on them. And then they receive the breath of life. And then they're an army on fire for God. What? What? God was doing it here in the upper room. Taking the ashes of their life, the the dust that was there, the uncertainty and the confusion and the chaos, forming it together and breathing life. Everything they thought they wanted the kingdom of God to be, to put them in power, everything they thought they wanted a Messiah to do for them didn't happen and they felt like a group that was just dead and kind of lost until the Spirit began to blow over their lives and pick them up together. There's something about the coming of the Holy Spirit that comes in passion, that comes in a way that you feel it, that you know it, that you are changed and transformed by it. Acts says it sounded like a rushing wind. We live in Florida. We know what the sound and the feeling of rushing violent wind sounds like. It leaves things changed and transformed. And when the Holy Spirit comes in your life, you don't just sit in a chair and put on a nice shirt and say, God is good. (laughs) But your life is radically transformed. It is blown apart. You are something different because the very power of God has come and made something completely different of what your life was. The Holy Spirit comes with prayer and purpose and passion and power. If wind symbolized a giving of life, fire symbolized God's power for His people. The first century Jews, they would have been aware of these moments, their stories that they had shared. How God spoke to Moses and called him in a burning bush. How God led his people out of slavery in Egypt by a pillar of fire at night. How Elijah stood on a mountain and all of these prophets of the false gods could not get their God to answer their prayers. But Elijah, he he tilted the scale so far against God, it's not funny. And God showed up with power and with fire. Here in Acts 2, when that fire falls on these first disciples, they are immediately enabled to do what Jesus told them they would do. They begin to witness and to talk to people about everything that they had experienced. The streets at Pentecost would have been packed People from every nation packing out the city. Residents from all of these countries as far away as Rome. And yet each one of them hears these disciples sharing the message of Jesus in their own language. 
What a dramatic display of God's miraculous power. And one that I think has less to do with the people hearing it and more to do with the people sharing it. I think God was trying to say something to the first people who were the ones wondering, how am I now speaking a language I've never learned before, and people are hearing it that way, and Jesus is trying to help them understand that the power of the Holy Spirit will enable them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, and near, here, hard, and far places that I will send you. It's like a coach. If a coach goes to a team that's been losing for a long time, and they're accustomed to losing, and it hasn't been going well, The coach knows that they're not going to come and in year one win the championship for their team. And so they go and they begin to assess the players and they begin to build a relationship with them. And their first goal is to say, I want these guys or these girls to begin to feel what it looks like to win. I'm going to find what the victory in their life is. The victories in their personal life, the victories in how they play the game, so that as they begin to have small wins, they begin to believe, I can do this. I can win the next victory. I won this small one for me personally. I won this one with my group. My team won a game against somebody we probably should have beat. My team won a game against somebody maybe we shouldn't have beat. My team won a road game against somebody we should have been decimated by. We can win. And Jesus is trying to show these disciples the mission that I gave you. The thing that seems daunting and seems scary and seems bigger than you. You will do when my Holy Spirit comes upon you. I will empower you with my Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses in places that are near, here, that are hard, and places that are far. When you don't know what to say, when you don't know the right language, I can even teach you, I can even empower you to share a language you've never learned. It probably won't always work that way for us. But it can. And it has. And I think what God is wanting to say is, you will move in my power. I have this kingdom that I want you to build. And it's not your power. It's not your strength. It's mine working in you. And as you continue to wait on me, and as you continue to receive my power in your life, I will enable you to be my witnesses everywhere you go with everyone you meet. And you will find yourself having conversations where you go, I never would have even thought of that. I don't know why I shared that. I don't know why I did that. I just trusted that maybe God had something he wanted to say to this person. And God somehow moved in their life and drew them closer to Him. The Holy Spirit comes with prayer, purpose, passion, power, and perplexity. The people who watched what was going on with these first Christians were perplexed. They didn't quite get it. Apparently several of them started to to mock and to tease this group saying, these guys have got to be drunk. They just look crazy. Watching these first Christians being filled with the Holy Spirit didn't quite make sense. They looked different, strange, weird even. If you're really following Jesus, chances are you're going to find that time where somebody looks at your life and goes, you look a little weird. In fact, if you've been a believer for a long time and you've never had anybody come up to you and look at the joy that you have and the way that you face life and the way that you embrace difficulty and hardships and seasons of life that seem to crush the rest of the world and you've never had anybody say, are you on something? You might need to check how in line with the Holy Spirit you are. But there's something about us that's different. Because the life that I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. I'm not who I was. I have been transformed just as Jesus came back from the grave. I am somebody different. And the rest of the world looks and goes, I don't quite get it. 
there's something weird about you, something different. The biblical word is holy. You just kind of seem set apart from the rest of the world. Sometimes being weird is a good thing, and rather than trying to run from it or hide from it or make sure that nobody else really thinks you are different or weird, maybe it's something to embrace. And to say, God, how do you want to use my life? How can I look different in a way that points back to you? Not just weird for weird's sake, but weird for your sake. Different in a way that others say, I want to know about this power that is at work in your life. The coming of the Holy Spirit was one of the most dramatic stories in all of Scripture. God was breathing a fresh breath of life into this group of people. And he was coming with fresh fire to say, I want you to have my power to build my kingdom. I'm empowering you to be my witnesses. This Holy Spirit comes with prayer and purpose, passion, power, and perplexity. And I want Him. I, I want Him in my life. I want Him in your life. And I want Him in this church. And I hope that you do too. I hope that Sundays aren't just a habit. I hope that the gathering place isn't just nice and comfortable. I mean, we work hard. We want it to be a, a good worship service and an experience that engages your heart. But, but I want so much more than that for it to be more. I want you to encounter the Holy Spirit here when we're together. I want us to draw near to the Lord in prayer. And I want to encourage you in your life. Not just to sign your name on the contract and say, yeah, I believe the things about Jesus. But like we started this year off with, that you would be invited to step into the more of God. A God who, who came, who, who lived, who, who died, who, who rose again, and who ascended into heaven. That you might look at your life, your life, that you would look at your life differently than you have. And that you wouldn't just believe all of the lies that Satan has tried to get you to believe and accuse you of who you are and what you cannot do. But that you would say there's a God in heaven. He created everything. He desperately loves me so much so that Jesus would do all that he did for me. And that God is real. And He is refreshing my world. He is making it new again. His idea at creation, it's His idea for eternity. I want to see Him make everything new. I want Him in my life to breathe a fresh breath of the Holy Spirit. I want the power of God to fall in fire on my life and on my church, and to start here, building something. Can you not see it? I am doing a new thing. But only if you believe in me. And only when you stop listening to Satan's lies, and you look at yourself, and you say, it's not about what Jesus can do for me but I believe in everything he has done and it's about what I can do empowered with the presence of his Holy Spirit to be a part of his kingdom to be a witness of his kingdom everywhere I go and so God here I am conform me to you it's not about what I want it's not about things going my way or going easy it's about your kingdom it's about you it's about what you want to do to bring us into relationship with you 
So change me. Change my position. Conform me to look more like you. And God, when you're ready, send your Holy Spirit that I might be filled with the power and the presence of Almighty God to do what I've been designed to do, to partner with God in bringing His kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. The enemy will lie and tell me I can't and I'm not good enough and a million other things. Help me to wait on you, to be filled with you, Breathe the fresh breath of the Spirit into our lives today, Jesus. And help us to sense the fresh fire of your Holy Spirit that doesn't leave us the way we came in, but changes and transforms and sends us on your mission. In Jesus' name I pray. I want to remind you again of the opportunity to give in worship through your tithes and offerings. Uh, there again are plates available as you exit the sanctuary, and you can go to oakridgewc.com slash give to give online. We want to invite you back. Next week, we'll be continuing our refresh series. But of course, before that, we want to invite you out to what I feel is one of the best events in the life of the church family, the opportunity to baptize those who are making a profession of faith. And so we would love to invite you out to San Key State Park to be a part of that wonderful celebration this evening. Go with God and have a great week. God bless.